the impacts can last for weeks. They can last for years. And in some cases, uh, especially um, looking at some of the tree ring records going back uh, upwards of 2,000 years, uh, there's evidence of, of droughts that last decades. At the same time, drought is a part of our climate, especially here uh, in the southern U.S. Um, we have always had drought. We will always have drought. It comes and goes on fairly unpredictable time periods. We are making progress in some of the predictability. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. The other thing that's interesting about drought is it affects different communities in different ways. So what is a drought for an urban area that relies on a large reservoir is different than a drought for seasonal growers, and it's different than a drought um, for a community that may rely heavily on groundwater. And that's one of the things that makes it difficult to define exactly what constitutes a drought. Definition of drought is often linked to an impact, okay? And that's what you know makes it kind of challenging. What is a drought in the humid southeast versus drought in the desert southwest? How do growers um, or uh, be it commodity or, or specialty growers consider uh, drought versus water supply managers who are concerned about reservoir management? And then how do you account for the natural differences in climate, say in California versus North Carolina? Each of these communities would define drought in a different way. Each of these communities start feeling drought impacts at different levels of, of dryness. So if we have to come up with just a broad definition of drought, something that covers every, just about everything but isn't really very uh, meaningful maybe, is the one shown there, a persistent lack of adequate precipitation over some time sufficient to cause impacts to a group, activity or sector. Again, the impacts are critical here. If you have no impacts, it's just dry weather. In general, we break down drought into two areas. We have short-term drought and longer-term drought. Short-term drought uh, tends to show impacts that dominate in vegetation, agriculture, forest systems. Longer-term drought is when we start to see drought that, that lasts long enough to persist and show impacts to hydrology. And here we're talking about streams, groundwater, reservoirs. So an urban area might not have any concerns about short-term dryness that may go on for a month or so, whereas uh, forest systems might. Similarly, um, the long-term uh, deficit of snowpack or deficit of, uh, of water over the course of several winters doesn't bring recovery to the groundwater, doesn't bring a recovery to our reservoirs. That's a real concern for urban areas. But as long as there's adequate moisture in the topsoil, then the vegetation does fine. So you can have drought that only impacts one community and not another. And even though these people may live side by side and have experienced the same lack of rainfall, the real trick there is what's the duration and what are the impacts? That's one of the real challenges with trying to depict local drought conditions. Let's talk about some, some examples, specific examples about uh, here in this case, meteorological drought. Well, this is usually just uh, folks like me who say, okay, we're down a certain number of inches for the year or, or some level you know, percent of normal. Um, Unfortunately, that's not really uh, a good indicator of an impact. And being down uh, in this example 8.32 inches at some airport doesn't mean anything because we don't necessarily know what normal rainfall is there. And normal rainfall at this location can be very different than normal rainfall uh, just a few hundred miles away. The ex classic example I give in North Carolina is where the southern Appalachians receive upwards of 80 inches a year. Uh, uh, central North Carolina re receives about 40 inches a year. Uh, being down five inches in one location has completely different impacts than being down five inches at another location. Meteorological drought is not very useful, even though that's what you see every evening on the uh, on the news from your local broadcasters. We're down x uh, x inches uh, over the course of the past year or since year to date. So meteorological drought definitions, the way we typically see them, are really not very useful for how we we want to think about impacts. Agricultural drought is when we're talking about specific. Uh, moisture deficits that impact crops, vegetation. Here we're talking uh, um, often referring to the top six inches, to topsoil moisture. For forests, of course, these root systems go on much deeper. Uh, and so we may be concerned about moisture in the soils um, for the first uh, meter or so. Uh, 
Um, for pine forests, of course, with the tap roots, it goes down much deeper. In some ways, they're able to take advantage of, of deeper moisture, and one of the reasons why pine forests can be more resilient than deciduous forests. Agricultural drought and the drought that affects vegetation tends to last weeks to seasons, usually in the warm season. But it almost always resets every year, it, it, especially in the southeastern U.S. here. It's almost unheard of, in fact, I can't find any example, where there wasn't adequate moisture over the wintertime to at least replenish topsoil. Now, that moisture doesn't always work its way down into the groundwater, into the streams and reservoirs, but at least the top of a few layers of soil uh, get their moisture put back into them over the winter uh, because we tend to get more rain and also because, and more importantly, evaporation rates are, are largely negligible. A good agricultural drought definition also accounts for typical seasonal variability. You wouldn't want to talk about um, uh, drought in the, uh, in the high plains of Nebraska or South Dakota trying to grow pine trees there. There's not adequate moisture to grow pine trees there anyway, uh, so you can't say that it's drought that's, that's causing the impacts there. Uh, so uh, lack of moisture for a specific crop or a specific impact doesn't always define it. It needs to account for the typical seasonal variability, the typical climatology of any given region. Hydrological drought. This does impact um, uh, commodities, crops, as well as forest systems because there is some irrigation sometimes, especially uh, in the seedling stage. Hydrological drought impacts water supplies, and here we're talking about a lack of rainfall over a long period of time usually, sufficient to cause impacts to streams, groundwaters, reservoirs. It often lasts more than one season. It can begin in any season. We can have droughts, uh, hydrological droughts that begin in the wintertime. These droughts uh, usually uh, persist for uh, sometimes is uh, two to three years. In the western U.S., we've seen these droughts that, that persist for decades. And then finally, if the drought is so severe over an extended period of time, we move into uh, what we call socioeconomic drought. And that's drought that really leads to broad economic impacts. And we're talking about extreme water supply restrictions, almost draconian water supply restrictions, uh, inability to produce power, uh, inability to do uh, uh, industrial processing, re requiring uh, layoffs, these are types of, of droughts that make and break uh, entire civilizations, especially as we look back in the distant history. Uh, famous civilizations, Aztecs, Mayans, uh, even uh, Mesopotamia, are closely, their, their uh, fall are closely linked to severe droughts. So what causes drought? We've gone over with all these different definitions. Ultimately, it's, it's associated with impacts. And in our specific area of interest here, we're looking for impacts to forests. What causes it? Well, at a fundamental level, it's just some shift in climate patterns um, that lead to a lack of storms, lack of rainfall, sometimes seasonal, sometimes uh, shorter term. With location, the exact mechanism changes. I'm going to give you some examples here uh, that, that are broad and fairly appropriate for the entire uh, southeastern U.S. But locally, uh, things, of course, can get more complicated depending on topography, proximity to water, and specific storm tracks. One of the things that, that has been a, a, you know, a huge advancement for the atmospheric sciences is understanding how the oceans are linked to the atmospheres and vice versa. It's a truly coupled system. And these are advances that have, been, that have really been made really over the past 30 years. So here in the southern U.S., what are we talking about? Well, a typical summertime condition, we have uh, this high pressure system out over approximately Bermuda. It's often referred to as the Bermuda High. And airflow around a high pressure system is clockwise. And so what we tend to see is warm, moist air that blows up into the Gulf of Mex from the Gulf of Mexico, covering Texas, uh, Arkansas, even all the way up into Illinois and the Midwest. Moisture coming up from the Gulf of Mexico, from the Caribbean that warm, moist, unstable air produces afternoon and evening thunderstorms on a fairly regular basis. The most severe summertime droughts we have, that high pressure system is often uh, dislocated or elongated and tends to have a stronger presence over the Gulf Coast. With the air being clockwise around a high pressure system, we don't get that warm, moist, humid air from the Gulf of Mexico. We get dry, continental air from the Midwest, from Canada. That is very dry air. It can also be associated with very hot air. And that's what leads to drought over, over the uh, southeastern U.S., the southern U.S. in general. 
In the wintertime, it's a little different. In the wintertime, we're influenced by large track storms, uh, the jet stream that, that, that carries these storms with them. In the summertime, the jet stream retreats further north. We don't see a lot of cold fronts. We don't see a lot of these big storms. But in the fall, in the winter, in the spring, the cold season, the jet stream dies further south, and we start to see more storms that track along. What we see with these are storm, uh, lots of moisture that's drawn up from the Gulf of Mexico, large storm systems that track along the southern U.S., east of the Appalachians. But there are those conditions that lead to drought even in the wintertime. An example here is La Nina. This is changes in the tropical Pacific Ocean, that, that in the center of your screen there, where the waters become much cooler than normal. Now, the El Nino-La Nina oscillation is a, about a two to eight year cycle. It's uh, predictable usually about six months in advance, but not always. And when we have La Nina, we tend to have drier conditions in the southern U.S. What happens is with La Nina, there's a reduction in the amount of convection over the central Pacific Ocean. That reduction in convection actually shifts the jet stream. And what we have is during La Nina winters is that jet stream is retreated further north. It's de-amplified. It doesn't dive as far to the south. And so we have fewer storms that track along the Gulf Coast, fewer storms that track along the eastern side of the Appalachians. And what that leads to is decreased rainfall in the, in the winter or in the south and increased rainfall across the Ohio River Valley during the wintertime. Now, I understand, and we're, we're learning, and one of the things we're really excited about with these webinars is to learn more about from the participants uh, uh, in, in this webinar. Uh, what are some of the impacts? And, um, Eric's going to talk about some of these things, but we've learned just, you know, I've learned just recently that during planting season, it's really critical. So actually drought in the wintertime can have huge impacts for seedlings as they're getting established. So being able to know the frequency and the intensity of El Nino and La Nina events and their relative contribution to rainfall in the southern U.S. can be very valuable for helping to know when it's appropriate and when it's risky uh, to, to do your seedling plantings. The other thing I want to mention is that human activity has its own influences on drought. We've seen this uh, pretty substantially. If we look back to the 1930s, the Dust Bowl era, and the start of Soil Conservation Service, and the efforts to try and uh, keep soil near the ground, to trap it, to in introduce vegetation to keep that soil from blowing around. Well, those changes in land use from uh, dry land uh, uh, cropping systems to irrigated cropping systems, from what was primarily uh, cropland to forest land, from rural to urban shifts, all of these have local changes in the heating and the moisture fluxes that occur in the atmosphere and can either enhance or mitigate local drought. The other thing, especially from a water supply standpoint of view, changes in how we manage our reservoirs, how we manage our rivers can also impact uh, drought vulnerability and drought severity. And these have implications for forest systems as well because the hydrology is connected. If we're pulling more water out of the ground for gra from groundwater supplies, that drops the water tables. That makes forest systems more vulnerable to drought during times of limited supply. And of course, the other thing is that you know, human activity towards global warming uh, is also one of these human activities that can influence it. The results from global warming uh, you know, manifest themselves as local scale climate changes across the region, across the locality uh, that are certainly have human connections. So we've talked about how to define drought. We've talked about what causes drought, at least in the southern U.S. How do we measure it? Well, because there's no formal definition of what drought is, it's a variety of things linked to impacts, there's also no single measure of drought. We have a, a, a dozen different measures that are out there that have been developed specifically to handle drought over different durations, over different geographical extents, and associated with different impacts. But they all have something in common. They're all links to the historical frequency of such droughts. So knowing the historical frequency, uh, having that long-term record is critical for understanding uh, and, and quantifying how severe any given drought is. 
In general, we break down uh, drought measures in terms of their links to hydrology and vegetation. Almost all drought measures have some sort of connection and linkage to precipitation. Some of them also incorporate an evaporation component. Some are linked to storm moisture and some are linked to hydrology. And I'm going to very briefly um, highlight some of those. At some level, we talk about precipitation, but as I mentioned earlier, using the definitions of meteorological drought are not often very useful because they're not closely linked to impacts. So talking about departure from normal, while it's often used, is not very meaningful. Similarly, uh, percent of normal is better because it's more comparable from geography to geography, but again, it's not very uh, closely linked to an impact. Uh, this is a map of what I'm talking about here. What you have here is the percent of normal rainfall across the southeastern U.S. over the past uh, 120 days. And what you see is that across Mississippi, northern Alabama, into the Tennessee Valley, uh, things have been fairly wet, dry, and across northern Georgia, South Carolina, the southern Appalachians, uh, fairly wet here in eastern North Carolina, fairly wet in southern uh, Florida. But that's over the past 120 days. When we look over just the past 30 days, you get a very different picture. Very wet in southern Georgia, across South Carolina, North Carolina, very dry across Mississippi and northern Alabama. So is there drought in Mississippi and northern Alabama? There might be short-term agricultural impacts to this area, but probably not longer-term hydrological impacts. What are the impacts to the forest systems? We don't yet have a very good drought index for forest systems. We do have some fire risk measures, but we don't necessarily have a vegetation health index for forests. That's something that actually I'd be very interesting in working with some folks to try to develop as part of the Pine Map project. So ultimately, drought comes from a lack of rainfall, but we want to make sure that there's a linkage based to impacts. So what we often link, or what we often measure, are those impact indicators to try and quantify uh, the severity of drought. Um, so for example, here is a measure of an impact indicator. This is average stream flow at a place here in central North Carolina. And I use this because it highlights the variable frequency. The background colors here are the percentiles of historical stream flow for this, for this location. And then the black line here is the observed stream flow. And what you can see is that in September, October of 2007, it bottomed out and we had what was ended up being record-breaking drought at this location. We could show that this stream was lower than it had ever been for this time of year. Note there is a seasonality here. Stream flows tend to be higher in the winter, lower in the summer, but even in this case, it shows that in 2007, September, October of 2007, streams dropped to record low levels, and we could say that this was a extreme, an exceptional in this case, drought, and then show how it recovers and varies through the, through the different time periods. That's a better indicator because it's linked to a specific impact in hydrology. Another way to look at it is groundwater. These are shallow groundwater wells. Again, I'm using examples from North Carolina. I hope these are visible and, and you can see the scales here. Uh, so these are groundwater levels measured at depths below the surface. So the first one is in central North Carolina. It's a, a, a deeper um, a groundwater well. Uh, the water level in November of, of 2010 uh, was uh, around 44 feet below the surface. And you can see how it dropped. You also have, again, colors for the background statistics. You can show how current conditions compare to the historical frequency of the water level at this location. On the right is a much shallower well from eastern North Carolina, where the soils are very different. You notice the groundwater is much closer to the surface. It also varies much more quickly. There's a lot more variability in the time series here than there is for uh, the Chapel Hill well in central North Carolina on the left. Both of these show the, the importance of looking at duration, the importance of understanding what causes the drought, but also the sensitivity to different time scales. Other measures of drought. Uh, there is a crop health and a topsoil moisture measure that gets put out by USDA every week, but these are broadly qualitative, not very quantitative measures. They talk about topsoil moisture being short, very short, adequate, surplus. Uh, those are qualitative and therefore useful in that they uh, show what the likely impacts are going to be. Unfortunately, they're not very geographically specific. They tend to talk about regions of the state or regions of the nation versus local areas where um, monitoring really would be more valuable. An ideal measure that, uh, of drought really is take using soil moisture sensors, putting them in the ground at different levels where it's critical for the, the impact of vegetation. 
and measuring what is the soil moisture. Uh, what is the percent of, uh, of soil uh, moisture available to be used uh, in the root zone? These measures are, are very useful. Unfortunately, they're generally only very locally representative because soils can vary greatly over short distances. However, uh, for uh, local monitoring uh, for a forest system, uh, availability and, and use of soil moisture systems can really be an ideal solution if you can afford to monitor um, at a local level. Uh, finally, uh, the other one that I wanted to mention, because it has potential for, for being used and maybe even modified for a uh, forest health uh, drought index, is the Keech Byram Drought Index. It's used by the Forest Service mostly for looking at fire danger. So it looks at topsoil moisture mostly. What's the likelihood of stuff burning? Um, it has shown to be uh, fairly useful for most of the southern forests. Uh, it doesn't do as well in very organic soils um, where the, the burn can actually occur underground. In this case, the amount of rain isn't as important as the frequency of rain to, and the, the relative humidity to suppress the risk of, of uh, a fire. This is an example of Keech Byram Drought Index that I uh, grabbed, um, showing you what the conditions are. Again, my example here is in North Carolina. This is available across the entire nation, although it is very sensitive to where the, the, the local monitoring stations are. Uh, we have a project right now with North Carolina Forest Service that we're going to be expanding and improving on this and hopefully be developing automated Keech Byram drought indexes um, for fire risk management that's going to be very high resolution over the entire southern U.S. Florida has a very nice product that they use. It uses radar estimates for doing Keech Byram drought index. We're also going to be working to try and uh, throw that in there as well. So those are some that are closely linked to impacts. There are others that I want to mention because uh, for some of your research studies, these might be useful for connecting to historical droughts because in this case we have very long-term records, estimates of drought going back 100 or more years, in some cases going back 2,000 years. These widely used drought indexes um, are more generic and can sometimes be linked to impacts, but sometimes not. Uh, there are Palmer Drought Severity Index, which looks at uh, both rainfall and temperature, and tends to be good for short-term drought. And that was one of the earlier drought indexes that was developed, um, well, by Palmer in the 1950s. It was later modified to have a longer memory term and consider look uh, uh, or be clo more closely linked to hydrological impacts. That's the Palmer Hydrological Drought Index. There's a variable called Standardized Precipitation Index, which uh, emphasizes more the historical frequency of the drought. It has a variety of different durations. You can go from a one-month SPI, uh, three-month, six-month, all the way out to 40-month uh, SPIs. And these measures are widely used. In fact, if you go and look for national drought monitoring, these are some of the ones that are, are more, most commonly used. Unfortunately, um, one, of, one of the advantages of them is we have, I, I can you know, send uh, observations from 1895, estimates of these um, for the entire nation very quickly. Unfortunately, they're, they're fairly coarse. They're only varying by month right now, and they uh, are multi-county, what we call climate divisions. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of this. So this is the, the spatial structure, the spatial aggregation for uh, a variety of the drought indexes that are used, including Palmer Drought Index, Standardized Precipitation Index. And you can see this is the current, or uh, uh, more recent, this isn't the current. I grabbed this uh, a couple weeks ago. A short-term drought index is blending a variety of different short-term indicators to show where it's been wet and where it's been dry. Compare that to a longer-term drought index indicator um, that's used. These are used as indicators to help guide the, the U.S. drought monitor effort that goes on every week. <clears throat> the U.S. drought monitor is a fairly recent effort. It's been going on for about 10 years now. It tries to um, link drought more readily to impacts. It has some real advantages for monitoring current drought. Unfortunately, for um, while it's useful, I think, for, for looking at current drought conditions and into the future, it's not very useful for historical analysis because it is subjectively developed. It is not an objective index. It has human in input. It has human expert analysis for depicting where they see drought severity based on a variety of indicators. It is not a formula and therefore not historically reproducible. I can't tell you what the U.S. drought monitor looked like in the 1930s. Um, longer term, what can we do, what can we not do looking at longer term guidance, what's going to happen into the future? Well, we don't have any ability right now to, to predict specific amounts of rainfall that might be indicators of drought over any given season or in any given year. I can't tell you 
uh, with any confidence whatsoever what the total rainfall is going to be for July in 2025 or 2050. Um, but I can tell you with more confidence whether we're more likely to have drought in 2025 or 2050. We have better skill in the winter time because we can predict El Nino and La Nina. We have minimal skill in the summertime because we aren't able to predict that Bermuda high pressure system with much accuracy, not only in terms of short term forecasts, what's going to happen next summer, but also longer term forecasts. This is one of the fundamental challenges we have with the global climate models, is they really struggle with these what we call semi permanent high pressure systems, these semi permanent anticyclones like the Bermuda high. I had a uh, very fortunate uh, this past uh, Monday to have dinner with a climate modeler, and we started talking about this. And, and the climate modelers are really, I mean, they're racking their heads trying to find solutions for how to deal with the predictability of these high pressure systems. It's a, it's a fundamental scientific challenge that we have. And of course, it's closely linked to drought in the southeastern U.S. We also aren't very uh, good more than uh, a season in advance, really talking about, or more than a few weeks in advance, rather, talking about where tropical storms are going to go. Of course, that has huge implications for the southern U.S. Uh, it can bring damage, but it can also bring much needed water to the southern U.S. And, and there are numerous examples of us going from severe drought uh, to uh, very healthy water supply conditions, especially in the topsoil, uh, from tropical storms in the summertime. Unfortunately, while we have pretty good confidence in the global climate models, the longer term ones suggesting that uh, as ocean temperatures heat up, we're going to have uh, more tropical storms, excuse me, more intense tropical storms. We don't necessarily think that they're going to be more frequent tropical storms. So we may see more category three, category four tropical storms. We may uh, not see the total number of storms increase. That's where the sort of the best science is right now. The best science also suggests that as we amplify the hydrological cycle, as we uh, um, increase the evaporation rates, increase the temperatures, that we're likely to have more drought as well as the potential for more flooding across the southern U.S. And that raises real uh, questions for how we do look at, at pine production and pine management. It may be that we can, uh, we need to be looking at species varieties that are more sensitive um, uh, to, or excuse me, less sensitive to shorter term drought, uh, maybe more resilient to shorter term drought because there may be a likelihood of, uh, of uh, heavy moisture coming soon. Maybe uh, looking at genetic varieties that can absorb moisture more readily and potentially store it or uh, take advantage of it when it's available, but not also um, be susceptible to damage, stress, or disease pressures when there's inadequate moisture for short periods of time. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Eric. Um, and Eric, I'm assuming we'll just take questions at the uh, at the end. Well, I, I have a couple of slides to load up here, and this might be a good time, Ryan, to entertain some questions on your okay. side, your presentation. That'd be great. So yeah, so um, I guess Matt, you moderate, and uh, folks uh, can tune in and ask questions as they uh, as they think of them. We really are, uh, I'll emphasize, just like uh, the, the previous webinar, we really are looking for this to be a discussion. And as much as anything, this is a, a good chance for, for me and for the climate community to learn some of the, some of the issues that, that you're dealing with and how you think about drought and how you try to uh, address drought, either in your modeling, in your genetics research, as you look at the, the economic impacts. Um, so I really would love to hear questions or comments. 